All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, you know, we've been having some pretty good weather lately as far as being cooler, which has been great. Um, and I know that always helps people when they're starting to think maybe about planting stuff for fall. But uh, it is definitely something you want to plan for ahead of time. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, obviously, you know, in the spring, we planted all kinds of wonderful, cool season crops. Um, and for the most part, I think they all did pretty well. People had lots of great lettuce and broccoli and cabbage. And right now we're seeing some giant cabbages that people are harvesting here at our community garden here in School Park by our office. So that's kind of fun. But yeah, a lot of those cool season plants have finished or they're done with. Uh, so you have a little bit of vacant space in your garden. And so now is a really good time to think about what you could plant in its place so you can enjoy harvest this fall. Um, so as far as for reasons for planting a fall garden, um, in the fall, you have kind of a longer period of time um, before it starts to get hot. In the spring, it starts to get hot and the cool season crops stop doing well um, because it's getting too warm for them. But in the fall, we have this long, beautiful fall season where it stays cool for a long time. Sometimes we get an early frost, sometimes we don't. Um, so it's just a nice long season for growing these things. The broccoli will just continue to produce and produce, for example. But another really important reason is sometimes maybe you missed out this spring. Maybe it was too wet in your garden. You couldn't get it tilled in time, or maybe you just, you know, didn't know when to plant things earlier. Um, so this is definitely kind of the second chance to plant all the cool season vegetables. It also just makes good use of your space. If you have open space right now, either where your early spring crops are coming out, or maybe you had something that didn't turn out, or um, for whatever reason, um, you know, use that space. This is a good time to be planting things. Also, certain crops uh, can be frozen, and it's a good time to stock them up for the freezer. So, I specifically think of things like broccoli um, is great for freezing, and so this would be a really good time to do that. But also things like green beans, um, other crops that. Uh, are well suited to freezing. And then the, the crops that you grow this year, or this time of year, the cool season crops will be higher quality because they are finishing up in cool weather rather than finishing up in warm weather. So a, a prime example of this would be broccoli again. Um, as, it, as it matures in the cool weather, it's sweeter, uh, better flavor. So um, it's just a, a higher quality crop um, compared, compared to the broccoli that you might be growing in the springtime. And also sometimes, but not always, the pests are less of a problem later in the fall than they are in late spring. So lots of good reasons for planting a fall garden. Um, but this is really important. And I always tell people this, that we call them fall gardens, but this is the first thing to know about planting a fall garden is that you don't planted in the fall. So, you know, people hear the term fall garden, they think, okay, yeah, this is something I'm going to start planting in September. Uh, but no, you really need to start them earlier here in uh, midsummer, late summer, so that they will get started now and have time to mature, and then you'll be harvesting them in the fall. So think about this main planting window is July 20th to August 31st. Um, and not everything, that doesn't mean you can't plant everything during this window. Uh, for instance, if you plant broccoli plants or cabbage plants August 31st, they're not going to have time to finish. But there are some things you can plant in late August. And we'll talk about all these different planting times, dates, calendar type stuff here in just a little bit. And just to, in case you're not aware, we actually have three seasons of vegetable gardening here in Canada. City, of course, and most people are familiar with the first two, uh, the spring cool season crops. That's where you plant stuff in early spring. You harvest them in late spring and early summer. Um, and then, of course, the summer warm season crops, you know, that's more things like tomatoes and peppers and eggplant and uh, melons and all that kind of good stuff, sweet potatoes. And there you're planting in late spring, usually like May, May, through the month of May. To the beginning early June. Um, and then um, 
you know, you have summer harvest and you're harvesting your tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, et cetera, all through the summer. And then on into the fall, if, if the crop's stay in good shape. But then the third season, and that's really what we're talking about today, is the fall cool season crops. And so again, you're planting in midsummer for fall harvest. Um, so really, this is our, our third season. So it's just a great opportunity to make your period of harvesting food from your garden a lot longer period. So you're harvesting things more year round. Um, the weather conditions are a little bit different for the spring garden versus the fall garden. Uh, and this might not seem uh, something that entirely intuitive at the beginning, but the more you think about it, it makes sense. In the spring, the air temperatures are cool. Uh, when you're planting for your fall garden, the air temperatures are warm. So it's going to be a little bit different. One thing is seeds will sprout quicker, but the soil can also dry out quicker. Um, the other thing is, in the spring, soil temperatures are cool. Uh, and planting late summer for fall garden, the soil temperatures are warm. Again, so that helps the seeds to germinate quicker, but you also just have to watch out that it doesn't get too hot for plants. Often during the spring, when we're trying to plant, uh, we're getting lots of rainfall, and that means you don't maybe have to water as often if you're planting things. But, you know, planting late summer for fall garden, uh, we don't necessarily have as much rainfall. Right now we're getting some pretty regular rains, but not quite as much as in spring. And who knows what it'll be like here in the next couple of weeks. We could have no rain whatsoever. Um, so you have to be a little more uh, intentional about making sure that you water your seeds, water your seedlings, just to make sure that they're moving along, obviously. And then the other thing that is kind of a factor um, in the springtime, every day that goes by, the amount of light is increasing. And so that is good for plants. Uh, in the fall, as we, we planted, even right now, it's not like we have low light levels, but the farther you get into fall, the shorter the days will be. So by the time you get into September and October, the days are much shorter. And so, um, it takes longer for crops to mature. If, if a pack of seeds says something takes 70 days, you know, in the fall, it could take a little bit longer because the days are getting shorter and the temperatures are getting cooler at the same time. So as far as like keys to success, here's some things that we um, think about for planting for fall garden. Um, and if, if you pay attention to these, it will definitely help you be more successful. So crop selection, choosing the right, the right crops, because not every vegetable crop is a good candidate for a fall garden. So we'll talk about which ones are the best here in a little bit. And then of course, timing is very critical. You want to plant at that right time, um, you know, that general planting window that I mentioned, but also we'll look at specifically at a planting calendar because every crop has its own little planting window that is the ideal time for planting. And then of course, watering properly, very important. And then a really big key to success that not as many people are aware of is mulching. Uh, just mulching your garden uh, is, makes such a big difference in the late summer and the, you know during the heat of that period, it's very important. And we'll talk about mulching and how to do that properly and why that's so beneficial. All right, so crop selection. Um, you know, think about pretty much most of the cool season vegetables um, that you plant in the spring, you could plant for your fall garden. A couple of exceptions would be um, Brussels sprouts. Um, you can plant them now for fall. They probably won't be as big of a plant as if you planted for spring because basically with Brussels sprouts, you're trying to grow a really big plant. The other two that don't work so well for fall would be if you're trying to grow bulb onions, they need kind of a long period and that really is gonna happen during the spring. It doesn't work so well for fall. Um, and potatoes. I do know some people who will plant some potatoes um, in July we're getting some potatoes in fall, but because we don't have the great temperatures, um, you know, for that, it doesn't work 
super well, but yeah, you can get a few potatoes if you really want to. It's hard to find seed potatoes to plant at that time. Um, so it can be a little bit difficult, but um, it can be done. Uh, but so potatoes, bulb onions, Brussels sprouts are kind of the, the cool season vegetables that don't work well. Um, so, but most of the other cool season vegetables will, will work pretty well. Um, the criteria for what crops you can grow for fall garden are pretty simple. Basically, if you want a cool season crop, there's a few exceptions. We'll talk about that in a minute. There's a few warm season crops that do okay. And then also a short season crop. And that's kind of what I was talking about why the Brussels sprouts, the bulb onions, and the potatoes are not good candidates because they take a, a longer time. But the short season crops, even things like, you know, cabbage, you know, takes 60, 70 days, that's fine. There's enough time for that. Broccoli, um, a really short season crop, crop like radishes are really easy to do because they take only about four weeks, 28 days. Very easy to do for a fall garden. So those are our two criteria that you're gonna be thinking about. And here's kind of the list. Um, you know, all these cool season vegetables that just talked about. Um, some of them you'll be planting plants, some of them you'll be planting seeds. And we actually have a, a cool season um, fall vegetable planting calendar that um, I'll show you here in a minute. As far as the, the warm season crops that you can plant for fall, these are kind of the three that I think about. One is green beans, um, but they do need to be bush beans. Uh, pole beans just would not have enough time. Uh, but bush beans um, work well. Um, summer squash, both the yellow squash, the yellow straight neck, yellow crook neck, but also zucchini summer squash, um, patty pans, um, any, of this, any of the summer squash will work well. Um, it's kind of too late for um, the, uh, the winter squash, things like uh, butternut or buttercup or acorn squash, a little late for that, um, but you could start them earlier. Um, and then cucumber um, is also something. Now, the planting time for these is just about past as far as um, cucumber and squash. If you're going to do that, you'd like want to get them in today. And you won't have a very long fall season, but you know, it's still worth doing um, just to get a little bit of yellow squash, zucchini, cucumbers at the end of the season, or maybe your plants that you planted earlier in May. Um, have kind of faded out already. But green beans, there's a nice planting window. Anyhow, these are actually warm season crops that, that do well for planting for fall. Again, that planting window, about July 20th to August 31st. So let's, let's, let's think about the, the calendar here. Um, what I tell people to do is look at the individual crop planting windows and on this planting calendar, and this is now available on our website. But then also you're gonna look at the extended forecast and then you're gonna pick the best planting days, um, especially if you're putting plants out with cooler temperatures. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like here in a minute, but let's look at that planting calendar. Here's the close-up version of it. So you can see there are different dates, um, arugula, um, like August 1st, the, the, um, August 20th is good. If you plant it a little bit earlier than that, um, you know, it might go to seed kind of quickly on you. Um, there's, you see the, the green beans uh, about July 25th to about August 10th. So that's not a very big window. That's just um, about three weeks. Um, you could actually plant uh, some at the beginning of the window and some at the end of the window to kind of space your crop out. And I like to do that also with things like lettuce. And some of these, if you're, if you're planting a little bit late or towards the end of the window, you can actually make up for that by using row cover. Excuse me. Um, so the ones that are probably the the trickiest are the ones that are plants. So think like broccoli, you look here and it says, again, 
July 25th to August 10th. And if you wait too late and plant that later, um, your broccoli may not have time to make a head. Same thing with cabbage. So um, definitely uh, want to watch those windows for those kinds of crops. The other thing that's a little bit different from the other ones here is garlic. It's really not a, a fall gardening uh, crop in the sense that you're not going to harvest any garlic in the fall, but you will be planting later in fall. So this is the one exception. You're not planting this in the summer. You're going to plant this in the fall. Look at those dates. It's like November 15th to December 15th. And that's because with garlic, you're actually like planting, uh, it's like a bulb. So like when you plant tulip bulbs, you plant them in the fall and then they, they bloom the next spring. With garlic, you plant them in the fall and then they you know, come up in the next spring. Uh, we, we do a workshop earlier in the year on garlic and onions. And you can actually go look at that if you want to find more about planting garlic. And it's available online for you to look at now whenever you want to. So um, anyhow, so this, this planting calendar is really, really helpful. It's available on our website, but it shows specific times for all the specific crops when to plant them. So this will just really help you um, with, with your timing. Um, one thing that happens often this time of year, even though it's the calendar says it's time to plant for your fall garden starting July 20th, lots of times July 20th is really, really hot. Uh, you might be having 100 degrees. And so that is not very good for planting. Uh, the, the seeds sometimes don't germinate well. You're setting out little plants. They don't, they don't do well if it's 100 degrees. So here's what I tell people to do. If it feels like it's too hot, maybe we're in the upper 90s, mid 90s, upper 90s, into the 100s, um, then what I tell people to do is kind of watch that extended forecast. Look ahead and see what does it look like, you know, you know a week from now. Um, because you still got some time in that window for planting your broccoli plants, your cabbage plants, your carrot seed, et cetera. So if it's looking better a week from now, then I'd say go ahead and wait. Uh, don't plant now. Don't plant on July 20th or July 25th. Wait till maybe August 1st. Um, and if you, even if it's even if it's not cool like we're having right now, we're having some pretty cool temperatures. Uh, but if it's if it's cooler, if it's if the highs are going to be in the low 90s and the nighttime temperatures are 70 degrees, that's not too bad. That's certainly will work fine. Um, it's just that if the daytime temperatures are like 98 and the nighttime temperatures, the lows are like 78 or 80, the plants will just not do as well. So look for at least uh, moderate temperatures of, of low 90s for highs, nighttime temperatures of 70, 72 are adequate. Um, also look to see if there's gonna be some rain um, because it's gonna rain a lot that could affect when you plant. But also usually when we get a rain, that means that the temperatures will be cooling down at least for a couple of days. So if we have a, a light rain and the temperatures drop, that's perfect planting. So uh, just kind of watch for that in the forecast. If there's no better weather in the forecast and it looks like, gosh, we're, we're tied into this period of high daytimes of 98, 97, whatever, and then nighttime temperatures are not cooling off very well, then I tell people, go ahead and plant anyways about August 5th, because that's getting near the time of the, the end of that window for a lot of those crops, like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower. So get those plants in, even if it's you know not looking good and you'll just have to take care of them. They may suffer for a little bit, but they will be okay because before too long, the temperatures will moderate. So you'll just have to take extra care of your transplants, make sure they're mulched, watering, maybe a little bit of shade. Um, and if you've planted seeds, you're gonna need to just make sure you water them, sprinkle them frequently just to get those seeds to sprout. Um, and that will help. So that's kind of what you do if if the temperatures are way, way warmer than what is ideal. So um, look for that extended forecast, 
if you don't see a, a little break in the weather coming up, then just wait as long as you can. And then kind of in that August 5th period to August 10th, go ahead and plant. All right, let's talk about preparing the ground for fall crops. Um, it's not a whole lot different than preparing for planting in spring, um, other than lots of times there's already something that's been growing in the garden and you will need to remove that. So let's say you had a bunch of broccoli, the plants are all done, they kind of look like they're dying, or let's say you had um, some you know, other greens, you know, and they're kind of dying out. Um, Maybe you had some potatoes and there's some leftover, you know, parts of the potato plant. Um, you want to remove all the plant residue from the previous crops. And if any weeds have been taking over or getting started, you want to get rid of that. Basically, you want to go down to bare earth. So it will make it easy to plant. Um, so, you know, that might be hand pulling stuff from the crop residues, hand pulling weeds, maybe hoeing some weeds, but then, um, you might actually till once you got that stuff out, or if you don't want to till, you could you could use your fork and dig up the ground and then rake. Um, if you're in a situation where you had weeds kind of take over, and that's not unusual, it happens to the best of us. Sometimes little patches of your garden will get away from you and start being overgrown with weeds, um, but you've already got all your your crops out of there. You know, sometimes uh, you just need to take a weed eater to it and chop all those weeds down. Definitely, you don't want them to be going to seed and start dropping seeds all over your garden. Um, if the weeds aren't too tall, you can go in and mow, and that'll make it easier to till, or at least make it easier to do the forking and raking type stuff. But either, yeah, between mowing and weed eating and you know hand pulling weeds, you wanna be able to get that ground clear so you can get ready for planting. Um, lots of times I get the question about what do I do with the stuff that I'm pulling out, like if I'm pulling out some plants, can I put them in the compost pile? And generally the answer is yes. Unless for some reason you were having a really bad disease problem, um, you know, it's fine to put all that stuff in the compost pile or even just to till it under. Um, weeds is a little bit different situation. If the weeds are starting to go to seed, I would not put them in the compost pile. Um, I would not till them under, I would just get rid of them. Um, so sometimes it's better just to discard that kind of material because you don't want to encourage more weed growth in your garden. But as far as getting ready, once you're um, got the plant residues up and the weeds out of there, you're going to till it up or turn it over the areas you want to plant. Lots of times um, this time of year, the ground is really dry. We've been having dry weather, and so it's difficult to till or it's difficult to fork. Um, so I actually recommend if the ground is super, super dry, go ahead and water this, the garden, even though there's no crops in there, just to make it easier to till, make it easier to fork up the ground, and that will help you. You don't want to get it so wet that it's muddy that you can't till, but um, usually if the ground's pretty dry and you water it, then within a day or so, it'll be really nice for tilling and just makes the tilling so much easier. All right, let's talk about watering. Um, you know, in the springtime, we get lots of rain. Uh, in summer, generally not so much. And even right now, we're getting a decent amount of rain. Uh, we're not getting too much rain right now. But um, if, if you get a rain that's like four inches, that's too much rain. If you get a rain that's an inch, that's perfect. And that'll get you by for a week or so. So, um, Good to have a rain gauge out so you can kind of measure how much you're getting and then you'll know how much watering you need to do. Um, but here's some watering principles that are kind of specific to your fall garden. Uh, well, some of them are. Um, actually, these are general principles, but they, they will have special attention, special importance during the, the planting for fall garden. So think about most water um, is lost by evaporation. And so it's direct from the soil surface. If you can slow down that evaporation by mulching, we'll talk about here in a little bit, um, that will mean you won't need to water as often. Um, but in the, in the summer, when the sun is really hot, the soil will dry out really quickly. It will evaporate from the surface. Even if you have a rain, sometimes the next day it looks like it's dry. And remember that soil always dries out from the top. The top inch is gonna to dry out first. 
So if you're planting seeds, they're going to be in that top inch of soil. And so that could dry out really fast, even if you water one day, the next day, it could be totally dry. So you'll need to water again so you get those seeds to sprout. The other thing, principle to remember is that younger plants, like when you put out a little baby plant that you, you just got from the nursery or from Kansas City Community Gardens, they're going to need to be watered more often because they don't have deep roots. And so you're going to water them more frequently and you're going to water them shallow. Lots of times we tell you to water deeply, but that's when the plants are established and the roots go down deep. At the very beginning, you water shallow because you don't need to water deeply because the roots don't go down deep. So you're going to be watering more often. Older plants need less frequent, but they will need deeper water. So that's, that's another, another situation. So think about those seeds and those seedlings. You're going to water frequently, you're going to water shallow, especially the little, um, little plants that you've just planted. Do not let them dry out, especially when it's hot, um, because you can't really have a lot of mulch around them. You can have a little bit of mulch. And then, of course, the seeds you put out, they're going to be trying to germinate, so you don't want them to dry out either. The transplants that you've just put in the garden, you again, even though they're not a seedling, um, they are seedling in the sense that they haven't been growing very long. So you're going to water frequently, you're going to water shallow. And what I really like to do when you set a plant out, like a cabbage plant, a lettuce plant, a broccoli plant, cauliflower, whatever, collards, is I like to put a little circle of mulch right around that plant, about eight inches in diameter. And it's not going to be super thick because you don't want to smother that little growing point, um, but it's going to be enough so that that plant won't dry out in just one day. You're going to be able to water it and, and have it go for two or three days before it needs watering again. And that will also just keep it cooler. The root zone will stay cooler. Um, it'll just stop the plant from drying out and getting stressed out. But the established plants later on in the season, and you won't need to water them as often, you'll water them deeply, you'll water them less often. And of course, at that point, your entire bed should be mulched so they won't be drying out too quickly. This is the same kind of watering guidance you would think about for your summer plants that are still going strong, hopefully. Things like your peppers, your tomatoes, your cucumbers, your squash, um, sweet potatoes, all these things, you're gonna water them deeply and less often. So think watering more like once a week, um, but watering deep enough so the water goes down deep to wet the entire root zone. Um, you know, not everybody has raised beds, but this will give you an idea because the same thing would be true if you had a little garden plot that was this size, but a 12 by 4 raised bed or a 12 by 4 ground plot, um, you know, think about over the week, the goal is to get one inch minimum, an inch and a half of water if, um, if it's hot, which generally it will be this time of year. That's going to take like 45 gallons of water just for that one raised bed. So that's a, a fair amount of water. And so if you're just standing there kind of sprinkling lightly, the top of the ground will look, will look muddy, moist. You'll think, okay, I've done enough. But the odds are, unless you actually are timing yourself that you didn't do enough time, it actually takes, if you've got average water pressure, which is five gallons per minute coming out of your hose, and you can measure that, I recommend that you do, um, because you might have lower water pressure, just get a five gallon bucket and see how long does it take to fill it up. And if you can fill it up in one minute with your hose, that means you've got good water pressure of five gallons per minute. Anyhow, so that's average. If you can do that, it's going to take you six to nine minutes to get that 30 to 45 gallons of water in one raised bed that's 12 by four or one you know, little garden plot in your backyard is 12 by four. So that's quite a bit of time. You know, you're gonna be standing there, um, you know, I don't know. It's just sometimes people don't wanna stand there that long. That's why sometimes it's easier to put like a sprinkler on or a drip hose or something else. Sometimes I'll actually, in the summer, I'll just go ahead and set the, set the hose down with the nozzle and just let it, just let it soak in. And then I'll go pull a few weeds for a second and then I'll move it to a different place. Um, so there's lots of different ways to do it. But I actually use my phone to set a timer just to know that I've given that bed enough water 
So it's going to be water deep down six to eight inches and water that we zone thoroughly. Just want to make sure you're giving it enough time. The other thing I like to do if you're hand watering is I like to have a good watering wand with a nice shut off. This is a watering wand here. And then the thing on the end, uh, lots of people would call that a nozzle, but um, that's what we call a water breaker. It makes a nice spray um, that's gentle for plants. Um, so many of the things that I see that people buy, the spray is too strong and it's, it's knocking over little seedlings. It's washing away the soil. Um, this thing puts out a nice gentle one. Uh, there's a particular one I like, it's called the Dram 1000. Uh, it puts out the super gentle spray. That's what we use in our greenhouse. All right, mulching. Um, mulching is probably one of the most important things you can do to have a successful fall garden. Obviously, those other keys that we talked about, like planting at the right time, picking the right crop, those are all important. But mulching is very, very important. Um, if you didn't mulch your spring garden, you can get away with that for a while because the temperatures are cooler, um, you know, et cetera. But when you're planting now here in late July and early August, it can be very hot and very dry. So mulching is definitely going to help you. Um, as far as what materials to use for mulch, I get asked this often. Um, here's kind of my three favorites. So I'm calling these the good mulches. Um, straw. Um, is great. You can buy straw in bales. We sell it here at the community gardens. Um, if you had some mulch left over straw from your, your spring crops, you can use that again. There's no problem with that. Um, straw is a little coarse sometimes. It's, sometimes it's a little difficult to get fitted around little tiny plants. If you've got little seedlings that are coming up, you can't put the straw too close um, because you don't want to cover them up. Um, but straw is great. Um, sometimes people get concerned about the fact that they get little wheat seeds um, popping up when they use straw. And that will happen, but it's pretty easy to pull out because straw basically is what's left over. It's the stalks of the wheat. Uh, generally, it's wheat. Um, could be rye or barley, but generally wheat straw around here. And um, it's the stalks after they've harvested the grain but sometimes little, little wheat grains get left in, and so they'll be inside that bale and they will sprout and grow. And it will look like grass, and you'll just need to pull them out, but they're pretty easy to pull out. But that's straw. Sometimes people talk about hay, and they use them interchangeably because they both come in bales, but hay is a different product. Hay is a pasture area that's growing leafy forage crops, grasses and legumes like clover or alfalfa. And um, that's being cut for animals to eat. Whereas this is, like I say, leftover stalks after growing wheat. Um, so straw is better. The problem with hay, if it was a good hay, it could be fine, but often hay will have lots of weeds growing up in the pasture and you're just importing lots and lots of weed seeds. So generally, hay is not recommended as a mulch crop. Um, so it's quite, as far as like how thick to put it, you know, when the plants are little, you're going to be putting it very thin, about an inch, maybe an inch and a half. Um, as the plants get bigger, it'll be more like two inches to three inches of mulch. Um, so anyhow, that's straw. Um, cotton burr compost, um, sometimes called cotton bowl compost, is a product that you buy in a bag. And if you're going to buy something in the bag for a mulch, um, that's probably what I would recommend, would be cotton burr compost. Um, it's basically what's left after they harvest the cotton. And it's kind of the, the little um, thing that holds the, the cotton ball, and that's called the bowl, B-O-L-L, -L, um, or cotton burr. And they grind that up, and they compost it, and it makes a really nice soil enriching compost. We actually use this as a mulch in our children's garden, the Beanstalk Children's Garden. It's a nice looking mulch, it looks kind of like shredded bark, um, but it just breaks down and helps to enrich the soil. And so at the end of the season, when we're done, you can just till it into your soil and it adds a lot of nice organic matter. So cotton burr compost is available at most garden centers and we do sell it here at the community gardens. 
and just makes a nice, nice mulch. Um, and then the third mulch that I'd recommend is just grass clippings from your lawn. And that is assuming that you haven't just had your lawn sprayed with chemicals, um, because some of those are pretty harsh and you would not be wanting to put those in your vegetable garden. But, um, you know, in my yard, I, I don't use any sprays in my lawn. Um, and I just go out and I use the grass catcher and catch the grass clippings. I put them in the wheelbarrow and then I put them directly on my garden. Um, and I'll put a, a thin layer at first and then a thicker layer as time goes by. I'll add some more and then maybe add some more later on. So you get a nice thick layer. And um, grass clippings work really, really well. They're, they're easy to use. Um, the one thing is you do not want to let them sit around for a long time before you use them as mulch because they'll start composting and they'll start to smell and they'll be difficult to work with. But if you put them down within a day or two, um, it works pretty well. The other thing is because they are fresh and green, there's actually some nitrogen in there and will help provide some nitrogen for your garden. So it, it's a good thing, not too much nitrogen, but just a nice amount. So grass clippings work really well. And then of course, they like the other mulches can be chilled in at the end of the season and will make really, really nice um, organic matter for your garden. So those are the good mulches. Um, the bad mulches, and I say bad because I think there's problems with them. Um, wood chips, um, shredded bark, rubber mulch, black plastic. I'll, I'll just mention each of these briefly. Wood chips, a lot of people, when they hear the word mulch, they think that means wood chips. And because they've seen like, you know, the utility companies um, will often you know, dump piles of these. You can get available. You can buy wood chips from companies. Uh, from nurseries, um, they'll bring you loads of it. It's cheap because they've got to find something to do with all these. Now, um, some of the composting companies will use some wood chips when they mix in with other things and they'll make good compost out of that. But just putting raw wood chips on your garden, um, sometimes what they'll do is that will tie up the nitrogen in the soil because the microorganisms that break down wood chips need nitrogen. So they're taking all the nitrogen. It's not available for your garden. The other thing is wood chips, um, as they break down, it seems like lots of times weeds will be growing in there very easily. I remember we did wood chip paths at our children's garden years ago over at 20 person Brooklyn. And we spent so much time weeding those paths um, because of all the weeds that would start to grow in there. Um, and if you don't put a thick enough layer of wood chips, um, then you'll get weeds growing up through them, and that's a problem too. Um, and you know, there's, I don't know, there's a whole school of gardening. You, you look on the, the internet, there's people that tell you like wood chips are the best thing ever, and if you just mulch all your garden really thick with wood chips, you won't have any problems and you won't have any weeds. And um, that may be true um, in the Pacific Northeast where I think that kind of gardening kind of developed. Um, they use some different wood up there um, and they also don't have the same kind of problems we do with temperatures and weeds and things like that. And so I don't know, uh, if it works for them, fine. I have not seen it work really well here in the Midwest. Um, the other thing is wood chips, if you have them anywhere near your house or sheds or anything, they really attract you know, lots of insects specifically termites that are not good things that you want close to your house. So I don't recommend it. Shredded bark is a little better, but pretty much the same. Also, both of them, I find when you're working them, um, you'll get splinters from working with them. And that's not good working with your hands. But also the other thing is it's not a mulch that you can just till into your garden at the end of the season because you don't want to till it in and then have all that problems with the nitrogen getting tied up. So straw, cotton burr compost, grass clippings are all good sources of organic matter to till into your garden at the end of the season. Wood chips, shredded bark, not so much. Rubber mulch is uh, a product they sell in bags these days. It basically it's shredded tires because nobody knows what to do with automobile tires. And that's not going to be good for your garden. Um, some people use it on paths. 
Again, there's problems with weeds growing up in between. Um, also some questions about, you know, possible environmental contamination from the tires. Um, so just really not a great thing. And of course, tires don't break down, so you wouldn't want to sell that into your garden. Uh, so it's not a very good mulch whatsoever. The other thing you'll read about occasionally uh, is people put down black plastic, um, black plastic sheeting. People used to do this specifically with things like uh, cantaloupe and watermelon, because um, that helps keep the weeds down, but also warms up the soil. The problem with black plastic sheeting is it does not let water through. Um, and so you have to make sure that you're watering underneath. It also doesn't let water escape when you have too much water. Um, so it can't evaporate through there. And then also it just heats up the soil in summer just way too much. So not a big fan of that. Um, some people use landscape fabric, which is a plastic fabric, but it has holes in it to let the water through. So you can use that for a mulch uh, material. Uh, it's not organic doesn't break down, so you're not adding organic matter, but um, landscape fabric definitely works better than just plastic sheeting. So those are the bad mulches. Let's talk a little bit about extending the fall garden season um, because sometimes, you know, frost comes early, like mid-October, um, and then, you know, certain things like lettuce and some of the crops would be done then because they don't tolerate, you know, a good hard frost. Um, some of the vegetables like kale and collards and spinach do fine with hard frost. Um, but in any case, lots of times we have a frost and then we have a nice, nice cool period where we don't have frost. And if, if the crops had missed that frost, they would have kept on going longer. So by using some season extending uh, materials, you can uh, protect the plants from that frost just like you do in the spring. And then your crops can go farther into the fall like into late October, into November, and even December sometimes, just depending on what the season's like. So it really is a chance just to make your fall harvest go a lot longer. So row cover is probably the best and the easiest. Uh, in the lower left-hand picture here, you see a cold frame. People used to use that basically as kind of a wooden box, like a growing box. You have to open and close it because when it's closed and it's sunny, it can get too hot in there. Um, Nice thing about row cover is you don't have to open and close it all the time. Um, some people also do high tunnels. It's kind of a miniature greenhouse thing that's not heated, uh, clear plastic. Uh, it needs to be vented though, and it can get super hot in there in the summer. But for extending into the fall, that can be a good way of doing that. Um, just need to make sure that when it gets too hot in there, you're opening it up and letting out the excess heat. Um, row cover definitely seems like the easiest to do. Um, upper right hand picture, you can see just some crops that have developed under row cover. Row cover is very lightweight. You can put hoops up or frames of some kind, or like in this lower left hand picture, you can just put it over the tops of the plants and they will lift it gently up. Um, here you can see what little transplants look like under the row cover, how well they're doing. So row cover is very, very useful material. Um, we sell it here at the office. You can buy it by the foot. Um, you know, it's generally you don't find it at the local garden centers, or if you do, it may not be a very good kind of row cover. Generally, if you're going to order a lot, you'd have to order it online and get it shipped to your house. Um, we've been getting a little bit of interest in people wanting to overwinter crops. So this is a little bit out of um, you know the the fall gardening thing because you're not really trying to harvest these things in the fall. You're trying to grow a nice plant in the fall and then protect it under row cover so that you can go out and harvest them in December, January, and February. And so um, we did some of this at the community gardens last year and it, it worked really well. Uh, some of our school gardens have done this and it's worked really well. Um, it's just really great to be able to go out in January, even when there's snow on the ground, and it's you know been like below zero. Yeah, you can harvest some useful, useful greens, specifically uh, kale, collards, and spinach. These are the three that do the best. Um, I mean, spinach will even go over the winter uh, without covering. But if you want to have nice leaves to harvest in January and February, we recommend that you use the 
the um, row cover, they'll just keep the leaves in better shape. Um, so um, all three of these will do well. Um, you plant this stuff generally in September, um, seeds for the spinach um, in September and plants for the, the kale and the collards uh, could be even mid-September, late September, and then row cover them and just let them grow through uh, end of September and then October and November, and then they won't grow a whole lot after that but they'll just kind of stay in a steady state and so that you'll get a nice big plant and can go out and harvest them in January and February and early March before your, your next crop next spring starts growing. So definitely kind of a fun thing to do and can be really, really useful. All right, now we're gonna talk about specific crops, um, a little bit about each one, the ones, some of the best things for growing for fall and broccoli is definitely one of the best going to have high quality plants in fall. It's a good candidate for freezing. We were talking about that. Even after you pick the main head here that's in the, the middle, um, then you'll get little side shoots coming up. They won't be as big, but you'll keep getting more coming along. Um, it is kind of susceptible to insect attack, just like in spring, although the later it gets, the less of that you'll see. You'll see the white butterflies and the, the moths. Uh, flying around laying eggs and you get the little worms, cabbage worms, cabbage loopers. Um, so you still need to control that. Um, you don't have the problem, lots of times in the spring, you'll have problems with the little broccoli buds starting to open prematurely. Or, uh, they start flowering and not very good, but in fall you don't have that. So um, you can just let it develop slowly and enjoy your, your broccoli for a long period in the fall. So. Cabbage, um, very similar is grow, growing habits. Cabbage keeps for a long time. Again, it's going to be better quality in the fall. You don't have to let it get to a, a big head. You can pick some of them at a small head, so you don't have to eat a whole bunch of cabbage at the same time. Uh, and again, they're susceptible to the, the same problems with broccoli and cabbage, those cabbage worms and cabbage loopers. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to see our insect workshop that's available online, go back and look at that. It'll tell you about things you can do to help control that. So there's some really good organic controls for controlling these insects. But anything in that cabbage family, cabbage, collards, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, all those things are susceptible to those same insects. Carrots, again, um, going to be higher quality in the fall because they're developing under cool conditions. Um, it's also a good long-term storage candidate. Carrots keep for a long time in the refrigerator. Um, it can also be stored in the ground. Um, so this is something that people used to do a lot uh, back in the day when you couldn't just go to the store and buy carrots easily. They would plant carrots and then rather than pick them all for fall, as it starts to get colder, they would mulch them and protect them and Carrots will stay good in the ground. They'll be protected from freezing. Um, they're not really growing, but you can go out in January and February and dig some carrots and have fresh, sweet carrots during that month. So that could be another part of your, your winter garden is carrots um, be able to do that. Um, when it gets really, really cold, it's helpful to have row cover over them. Uh, just keep, keep them from, from freezing. Um, Sometimes the ground freezes around here, sometimes it doesn't. Um, as far as planting carrots, the seeds are a little tricky to germinate, especially when it's hot and especially if the soil dries out. So you've got to make sure that um, you're keeping that soil moist. I would continue to uh, water lightly, like with a, a soaker hose or a mister of some kind, or just a really gentle spray and water those seeds every day, sometimes it's gonna be two or three times a day because you want them to stay moist. If the soil dries out and gets crusty, it'll stop the carrot seeds from germinating. And then once they do start to germinate, um, because it's so easy to drop lots of little tiny carrot seeds close together, um, you need to thin them out. Um, feel like one to two inches apart just so they have enough room to develop. We have a variety that we like a lot. That's the one here at the top. It's called Mokum, M-O-K-U-M. It's an improved uh, Nantes type carrot, uh, very sweet, uh, very crisp, and it's an early, early, early carrot, so it's really good for fall garden. 
cauliflower, uh, again, it's like broccoli, similar in many ways. Uh, you're going to start, you're going to be planting a plant. You're not going to be planting a seed. Cauliflower is a little unique um, because it has this white um, head, which you're trying to protect uh, from the sun. You're going to pull the leaves up, the, the upper outer leaves, and you, they're called the wrapper leaves, and you're going to wrap them around and tie them. Uh, sometimes people will use like a a clip of some kind, like a clothespin or something, and that will shade the cauliflower head once it starts to develop. Once you see it start happening, you want to shade it from the sun to keep that um, head in good quality, good shape. Um, otherwise, it will start to turn, turn color on you, won't be as good quality. Um, you want to pick this cauliflower when you've heard this go tight. You don't want to let them start to open up. Sometimes in Kansas City, it gets a little tricky. Uh, just depends what the weather's like. Definitely needs a, a nice cool season. So usually it does pretty good in the fall. It's, I think it's easier to grow in the fall than in the spring um, because of the weather. It's not getting hotter. You don't want to wait too late to plant because it needs enough time to develop that head. head. And again, it's still going to have the same problems as cabbage and broccoli, as cabbage worms and cabbage lupus. Um, Chinese cabbage, a lot of people haven't grown this before. It's really fun to grow and easy to grow and very tasty. Um, if you've had, um, you know, gone to Asian restaurants, you'll you probably had, if you've had stir fried vegetables of any kind, generally that would be Napa cabbage or Chinese cabbage and, as opposed to regular European cabbages. Has a long storage life, not quite as long as regular cabbage, but it will keep in your refrigerator for quite a while. Um, fall plantings are going to be higher quality. You don't have to let them get full grown. You can keep them small. Um, they don't have quite as much problem with the cabbage loopers and cabbage worms, but they have quite a bit of problems sometimes, especially in the young stage, with flea beetles. Um, uh, because it's not a, a smooth leaf, it's kind of a, a rough leaf. The flea beetles seem to like that, um, just like radishes and turnips. Uh, but, you know, generally it's not too big of a problem. It's interesting that these can get pretty large and um, weigh quite a bit. And if you go to the store and buy these, they're generally at least $2 a pound. And so if you grow a, a nice good size four pound, you know, Napa cabbage, that's like would cost you $8 at the grocery store. So it's definitely worthwhile to grow your own. Green <laughs> beans. Um, Hopefully you planted some in the spring and got some. The reason we can't just grow green beans great here all summer is because it gets too hot. Um, once you get kind of past the, the middle of June, um, you have upper temperatures that the beans don't produce well in July and August. So really what you're trying to do here is grow a nice bean plant that's going to have lots of beans on it in late August and early September when it's not quite as hot. Um, it can be warm, just not super, super hot. Um, so you want to grow a short season variety. Again, only bush beans, no pole beans, uh, nothing like lima beans, which has to have really warm weather to produce beans, but general, what we call snap beans or green beans. Um, here, the person down in this picture that's holding them, those are regular green beans on the left are some of the dragon's tongue bean, which is a a nice uh, French bean, it's very, very tasty. We like it a lot. Um, and you want to pick them at the proper stage. Don't let them stay on the plant too long and get tough. A, because they won't be good, but also that'll slow down the production. But if you keep picking the green beans, it'll just keep on producing. So um, definitely worthwhile to grow some green beans. You can also grow a lot of extra ones for freezing because it's a good freezing candidate. Lettuce, uh, fall lettuce generally sweeter, uh, usually does not get bitter and go to seed as quickly. Um, if we have a really hot fall, you can still have that. Some varieties, you know, again, go to seed earlier than others, like butter crunch is just kind of goes to seed very quick and gets bitter quickly. Um, but you can grow full-size heads. We have really nice uh, canasta lettuce. It's a French crisp lettuce. We have a really nice romaine lettuce and a really nice butterhead lettuce. Uh, that all are really high quality. If you, want it, if you like head lettuces, you can grow some really nice ones. You just don't want to plant too early um, to have things go to seed and get bitter on. 
Um, but definitely worth planting lettuce for fall. And if you space it out and if you use some row cover, you can have a nice long lettuce season. Fall is also the one time that you can actually get a lot of your, your salad vegetables all together at the same time. If you still got some tomatoes that are producing in the fall and some peppers, and then you've got some lettuce all at the same time, spinach, you can make a really, really nice salad just from your garden. Spinach um, is a little bit different than many plants. It's actually a winter hardy plant um, in its young stage. You can go through the winter. Um, it is an annual. Um, you can harvest it throughout the winter if you protect it, like I was talking about, using row cover. So it will produce really, really, really well. If you plant some spinach for fall and it's small, um, not large, um, it will produce early crop in spring. Um, once the weather's temperatures start to warm up just a little bit, that'll be the first spinach that's ready, be ready much earlier than anything you plant next spring. So it just kind of makes your spinach harvesting season much longer. And also the fall planted spinach doesn't grow to seed quite like the one in the spring does fairly quickly. So um, lots of good reasons for planting spinach. We have a variety that I recommend to you called Noble Giant. Um, really, really great spinach, has large leaves. Sometimes people have a hard time getting good sized leaves with their spinach. And that one has nice big leaves, easy to grow. Collards or collard greens, uh, it's a relative of cabbage. You can actually plant that from seed if you want. Um, or you can put out transplants. Some people actually have collard plants still left from their spring ones. And if they've been taking good care of them, they're still harvesting. And you can do that. You can just plant them in spring, let them grow all spring, summer, and into fall. Um, some people like fall planted collards because the leaves are going to be smaller, maybe a little more tender. Um, but a lot of that is just picking at the right time. Here in this picture, you can see some spring planted collards that have been just harvested all spring and all summer. And now they're starting to get tall and just have these bare stalks at the bottom. But they keep on producing and getting taller and taller. So you pick the leaves from the bottom up and the plant just keeps on growing. Very cold hardy, even without protection. Um, you can get them to go till November often and occasionally December. But if you have new collars that you've planted that aren't too tall, you can put the row cover over them and let them grow and grow in through the winter and then be harvesting some in January and February. Kale, again, is another one of those very, very hardy vegetables. Um, similar to collards, you can, you know, again, have it planted in the spring and be picking it over the summer. Uh, maybe not the highest quality over the summer, but still, you know, good, good kale. And then in the fall, if you're taking good care of them, they'll continue to grow and get taller and will continue to produce, but you can also plant new plants in late summer. We'll have new plants available. And um, you can actually plant kale from seeds if you want to try some, just from seeding it in the ground, or you can get plants and get a head start on it. So, and again, this is one of the best plants, again, for overwintering under the row cover and then being able to pick it all through the winter. Arugula. Uh, grows very fast, you know, kind of peppery tasting greens. Best to eat them when they're fairly small, they, they aren't too hot and spicy, or some people call it a skunky taste. Uh, it's better with arugula just to go ahead and plant them directly in the ground, plant the seeds rather than uh, trying to start arugula as a plant. We don't even sell arugula plants just because, excuse me, they go to seed pretty easily if you do that. They do get troubled by flea beetles, some not so much by the cabbage roofers or cabbage worms, but flea beetles can be a problem on um, arugula. Cilantro um, is best to seed directly rather than doing transplants also. Um, transplants just go to seed fairly quick, they bolt. Um, you're just going to want to continue to pick the leaves on the cilantro. Um, and I recommend planting several crops of it, so plant some at the early part, like in uh, end of July, some in early August, and some middle of August, some late August, and even early September, you can try planting some. Um, and they'll just last longer and go on for longer than your spring planted crops. If you're not familiar with cilantro, it's 
it looks kind of like parsley and people get it confused in the grocery store all the time. The easy way to tell is the smell, of course. Cilantro has a different smell. Uh, it's really popular in lots of Hispanic cooking and very tasty. Um, the seeds of cilantro, it, when it does finally go to seed, um, actually is what they call coriander. And that is also used as an herb uh, and spice flavoring. So very, very, very interesting garden plant and fairly easy to grow. So that's pretty much it. But I wanted to tell a little bit about plant and seed availability. Um, we still have seeds for most of the cool season vegetables available. Of course, you can buy them online through us if you need to do that. You can also order them from garden catalogs. A lot of the, the garden centers uh, maybe don't have as many seeds left this time of year. They, they're kind of done selling seeds, but some of them still have seeds to sell. Um, you can also start your own transplants, but you need to know uh, that you have to start them early. Like we started ours about July 1st. Um, for planting coming up here in the end of July. So it's a little bit too late to start your own transplants of broccoli, cabbage, things like that. You can still do kale or collards right now if you want to start them. Um, the other thing is you can buy seedlings from local greenhouses, but almost always they don't have them at the right time. And I think the problem is that people think about fall gardening and they don't think about it until early September. And it's still warm then, so people think they have a lot of time, but you do not have enough time to plant broccoli plants or cabbage plants at the beginning of September and have them make head of time. They won't mature. So all those people who are buying those plants in September at garden centers are not doing themselves a favor. So you definitely want to buy them at the right time, end of July, 1st of August, uh, first, you know, first 10 days of August or so. So we're going to have our plants on sale here at Community Gardens starting July 21st. Broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, napa cabbage, kale, collards. We're also going to have some Swiss chard. Um, that'll all be available July 21st. And, you know, people can keep buying those until they're gone. Usually we don't sell out completely this time of year um, because not as many people are doing it. But, you know, more and more people are learning about fall gardening. So, um you know, all the way through that planting calendar of about April 10th is the good time for those crops. Lettuce is a little bit later because you don't want to go to seed. We'll start selling those plants for the head lettuce on August 20th. And you can keep planting those on through the end of August and you know, the first half of September easily and even almost to the end of September. So that's kind of the timing. That's when we'll have the plants. Uh, so yeah, come out and get your plants. And if you haven't had a membership before, you can sign up for a membership. And uh, really recommend you try fall gardening. Uh, it's kind of like, just makes another whole season for gardening. It makes your garden so much more productive. And of course, it's just great to have all that stuff available in fall and not have to go out and buy it. So, all right. So I'm gonna check to see if I have any questions. I don't know if Rob is still around. Um, Hey Ben. Yep, I'm here. Um, yeah, I actually sent you two emails, so okay. uh, check both emails and go ahead and stop your uh, screen share. I'm going to go uh, show yeah. some people some things on the website here. Okay, so just to let everybody know. Um, hold on. Can you see my screen? Can you see it, Ben? Okay, uh, so um, if you want to see a recording of this presentation, you can go to um, kccg.org, go to resources here, how to videos, and then down here there's a uh, virtual workshop link, and that will take you to all the recordings of all of our workshops, including this one. I'll have this one up um, later this afternoon. But here you go. Here's all of our workshops this, uh, the, from 2021. Um, also under this resources page, I want to point to this uh, gardening guide sheet uh, link. Um, so again, resources, PDF guide sheets, gardening guide sheets. And you have a bunch of uh, PDFs here that can kind of help you out, including the fall gardening calendar that Ben went over uh, earlier today. So um, that's all I got. All right, so um, garden questions. Um, 
one question somebody said it's almost time for garlic harvesting are there any issues need to be aware of when planting any of these vegetables in the place where the garlic was um, first of all if you haven't harvested your garlic you need to do it very soon you're kind of late actually um, if you wait too long, I usually think of harvesting garlic around June 20th or so, when it's just starting to turn yellow. If your garlic plants have completely died down, what's happening is sometimes your garlic bulb will split apart. That doesn't mean you can't use it. It just means that it may not keep as long. So um, that can be a problem. Um, so definitely wanna think about harvesting your garlic a little bit early, but as far as planting something in its place, uh, no problem whatsoever, it should be fine. Um, plant anything there. The next question was um, somebody had planted early squash, pumpkin, summer squash, and zucchini, and it all died probably because they had borers and they have very limited space. Is there anything they can do to prevent uh, this happening for their fall garden? Um, well, yes and no. So um, A, just the timing of the season, you're less likely to have a problem with squash vine borers. Um, Possibly at the very beginning, it could still happen because there's usually two generations. But if you haven't planted your zucchini or yellow squash yet, you need to plant it very quickly because the time is running out. Because um, you've only got a couple months uh, here before it starts getting too cool. So um, plant them now. Um, keep an eye on them. Uh, you can use sprays of uh, like the, the BT or the... Um, Spinosad, um, and if you spray maybe once a week, that will help prevent the borers from getting in there, um, and that can help a lot. The other thing you could do would be to put some lightweight row cover over the top and keep the borers out while the plants are developing, and then if, when it gets time for them to bloom, the borers should be done and, and not be out, you know, flying around. So um, that could work too. So yeah. Definitely, it's a good time to try. You just need to get those seeds in quickly. Um, next question was, does the season, uh, so watering, mulching, all that stuff, does that apply to um, indoor and container gardening also? So indoor is another whole thing. If you're growing under lights and trying to grow greens and things, obviously the timing is not going to affect. Uh, mulching is not going to be a big factor. I don't know very many people who are actually trying to grow crops indoors under lights. That's kind of a specialty thing. Um, but as far as container gardening, if you're gardening outside, yes, the timing all still pertains. Uh, you still want to mulch. Uh, in fact, with containers, you need to be even more cautious about watering and not let them dry out too quickly. So that would pertain, all that stuff would pertain to container gardening for fall also. And then another question here, someone said they heard that cedar uh, and peat moss are also good for mulch, and I would say no. Um, cedar, again, is a, a shredded bark material. Um, it's not going to break down quickly. In fact, it, it lasts longer, so it's going to have that effect on tying up the nitrogen in the soil. It will work okay as a mulch, but when it comes time to till it into your soil, it won't be good for your soil. Um, so you could use it as a mulch if you had it. Um, it's just not my favorite. But when you're done, you'd want to pull all that cedar off and not till it into your garden. And peat moss, it's, it's a fine organic material, but just doesn't make a good mulch uh, because it's so uh, water repellent. If you've ever put like plain peat moss on the ground and tried to water it, the water just kind of runs off. And then when it dries, it just gets hard and crusty. And when it dries, the wind will actually blow it away. So um, peat moss, really not a great mulch. It's okay for adding to your soil to help improve the soil. It's also really good if you're trying to grow something like blueberries. Uh, like you want to add a lot of peat moss to make the soil more acid. Uh, so it's good for that, but it's also fairly expensive. So it's just really not a great mulch. Uh, got one more email with a few more questions here. Uh, what about newspaper for a mulch barrier? Sure. Um, you can use newspaper, um, and if you have shredded newspaper, that works pretty good too, um, but just putting down sheets of newspaper, um, it looks a little funky, of course, you know, to see newspaper in your garden. Uh, some people will put newspaper down and then put straw or grass clippings on top of it. You can do that too. Um, yeah, just don't want to use any of the slick um, 
newspaper that's shiny or even the colored newspaper, um, sometimes the inks are not good materials to have in your garden. Um, but anyhow, um, you can use newspaper definitely. Um, other than the color, um, row cover and landscape fabric, oh, Row cover and landscape fabric look the same, are they? Okay, no, row cover and landscape fabric are very, very different. Um, so row cover would not be a good mulch um, because um, I, I just think it, A, it would heat up your soil. Um, and I mean, I just don't know if it would effectively keep it down because it would let light through. So you would get weeds growing underneath there. Um, and Landscape fabric would work good as a mulch, um, but um, it would not be good for trying to cover your plants to protect them from frost, to protect them from insects. So you would never want to use landscape fabric as a row cover to protect your plants because you wouldn't want to cover them up. And generally, you would not want to use landscape fabric as a mulch just because it would let light through and it would not smother out the weeds. So um, next question. Um, do row covers serve mainly to keep frost off the plants or to retain warmth? It sounds like good ventilation is important. Um, so it does um, keep the frost off, but it does maintain warmth. It holds some warmth in from the ground. And um, that in, when, the, when it's cold out, that's important. The difference being is that it does not keep too much heat in. So like when the sun shines in on it, it's not going to heat up like clear plastic because it does let excess, excess heat will escape, but it does help insulate plants from really, really cold temperatures. Um, so it is good for growing plants in the cool, you know, very, very late fall and, um, and of course early spring and over winter. And it's not, you're not going to have problems with ventilation because excess heat will escape. Um, uh, last question is, um, <laughs> oh, they're talking about <laughs> chasing the moss with a badminton racket. Um, I haven't heard of this too much, um, but I could see that working. Um, you know, if you're seeing those like white butterflies that are going to lay eggs on your, um, on your cabbage and broccoli, hitting them with a badminton racket could do that if you want to go to all that trouble. Um, this person says, it's it's a it looks silly chasing them around the yard, but it's very satisfying when they when they get that, and I, I get that totally. Um, there is a one of our staff people actually has something that looks kind of like a badminton racket, but actually has an electric thing to it. It's mainly for killing flies. You could also use it for that too, um, for swatting at the moss that um, do that. So anyhow, yeah, there's lots of different ways to control insects, but. Um, you know, it just depends how much time you want to spend chasing moss around the yard. So anyhow, I think that's it for the questions. Um, you always can send more questions to us by emailing them to contact at kccg.org. And we'll try to answer your questions that way too. So um, thanks for listening. Tell your friends and especially your gardening friends about our workshops so they can uh, benefit from them too. And we'll see you next time. And Ben, sorry, um, yep. my, I don't think my screen share was working uh, earlier, so I'm going to go through that thing again. Sure. Um, yep. I think it's working now. Um, but anyway, if you go to our website, kccg.org, um, and you go to the resource uh, tab here, how to videos, oops, um, you can go to all of our recordings of our virtual workshops there, including this one, which I'll have up later on this afternoon, as soon as it loads. Um, and then also under the resources, there's these PDF guide sheets. You can go to the gardening guide sheets link. And right down here at the very bottom is that fall gardening calendar that you have, uh, uh, along with uh, all kinds of other gardening guide sheets. So um, that's all I have. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.